everybody. Thank you very much for coming uh, so early when uh, you could have a good breakfast or uh, discover a lot of uh, exciting technologies. Um, I, it's uh, just a, a, a bit surprising to have this sound, okay, to hear me and to hear the sound outside with uh, so many people. <laughs> Okay, let's imagine we are close to the sea with the water, the waves, uh, contributing to our um, ecologic uh, environment. So, uh, I would like to present you not only works I have done, but also reflections about art and uh, uh, interactivity and technologies. So the, the title I gave first was uh, uh, From Immersion to Critical Fusion. You will soon understand why I prefer to call it The Revenge of Homo Faber. Homo Faber. I've been uh, working for the last 20 years uh, with technologies like uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, many kind of interactivity and network, uh, internet, uh, urban screens and so on, you will see. But I think for me, what was more, uh, what was the biggest shift uh, uh, brought by technologies inside the art world is probably not virtual reality, but more virtuality. Virtuality can be considered as a required condition of the plasticity of the real. You know, the artist is supposed to work with a material that is plastic. That means a material that can take a shape and keep it. If the world wouldn't have any plasticity, first of all, we, we would probably block before the Big Bang. Second thing, uh, we wouldn't uh, be there talking, exchanging about topics like that, and the world wouldn't exist as we know it. The artist is probably trying to shape objects, but also to shape thoughts and to shape, to shape the world in a way. Probably contributes even in a very small part in shaping the world. The first thing that was brought by real-time technologies is probably action. You know the story of Xerxes and Parasius from the uh, Pliny the Old who told the story of these two great painters three centuries before Christmas. It was a competition. In this competition, they were supposed to present two works, two painted works, and the audience was supposed to decide who was the best painter of his time. The first one was Xerxes. He unveiled the painting removing the curtain and people discovered grapes so beautifully and realistically painted that a bird passing by came and tried to pick them. Everybody was amazed. It was really great. It went, it went so far in realism that animals could be uh, mislead and take painting for real. Then Xerxes was very proud of what he has done. He turned to world Parasius and said, it's your turn now, and he tried to remove the veil of the painting. But Parasius' painting was actually the veil itself. The first one, the, the first one probably mislead the, the uh, animal, the second one, the people.
the painter. Why I mention this about action? This story is really great. Everybody remember about Xerxes, and is all, it's always taught about the question of realism in the history of painting. But I don't know why they never mention what makes the big difference between both works. It's not only the second one uh, push people to take it for granted, for, for true. It's also that Parisius in his work actually included the gesture of Xerxes. Without Xerxes' gesture, Parisius' work means nothing. Imagine Parisius trying to unveil his paintings and <laughs> it's fake. Ridiculous. He needed, he thought, he thought about his painting with the action from Xerxes. So for me, in history, it's probably the first, uh, the first time that interaction became the condition of the meaning. And this is what we are talking about. We are talking about creating meaning with interaction. Interaction brings many things that was not possible before. Real-time interaction, I mean the fact that what you see is, or what you hear is produced at the time that you, that you see it, there is no visible or perceptible delay, is something that changed a lot the nature, the very nature of the work. So first, he introduces qualities in works, in artworks, that belong to the humankind, or to animal at least, but that so far couldn't be applied to, uh, to artworks. So, the work can perceive something from outside. The work can react from this perception. The work can adapt itself to the fact that there are people in front of it. The work can create a real kind of dialogue with the people by changing the reaction according to the complexity and the variation of everybody's uh, actions or behavior. More and more the work can feel so emotion belongs to the work as well. And the work becomes autonomous. Even if the artist is not here, it keeps on evolving, keep on doing things, reacting, having something that evolving maybe in a way that the author couldn't control anymore. So the 20th century in art was a big move. Until the 19th century, of course, the fact that the artist was able to do the thing, to make the thing, to show skills in uh, practicing, practicing um, techniques, was one of the main components of the artwork. In the 20th century, we started to think that the fact that the artist uh, use his brain in producing something is probably the first step of art creation. It's something that became dominant until conceptual art where it was even not necessary either to do or to show or to present or to give any perceptive experience that could be appreciated by the audience. The 21st century, with the rise, uh, the rise of technologies, make us coming back, probably, to the age 
of uh, homophobia. Homophobia is the one who creates tools to do things. And this is exactly what most of the people here are doing. They work with tools, they create tools, and with tools they create new tools. But the problem is, you know, as Leonardo mentioned when he said that art is first cosa mentale, that means something from the mind, a thing from the mind, thing that belongs to the mind. And maybe if we are too, too deep inside technologies, it becomes more difficult not to forget that we use this technology to say, produce, experience, explain, give, exchange things with other people. Maybe we should look for some kind of sensitive sensibility. Projects, works, that are at the same time an experience and a meaning. I would like to uh, present works from the last 20 years uh, where I try to do this. I mean, to convert thinking, thoughts into uh, a shape that includes and maybe take advantage of uh, interactivity. So, when I... Okay, I did some uh, uh, 3D computer graphics first, and then I uh, started to use um, virtual reality. And the first thing I thought, okay, if I want to do something in virtual reality, what is the equivalent of the blank page? Is this space full or empty? The blank page, we know, is full of light. And whatever we do on it, it's removing the light. The VR space, is it this black thing in which we should uh, dig or we should put something that becomes visible? We have to think about what is the material we start from. You know, exactly as if we wonder if God created, created the world from scratch, from nothing, or did he organize pre-existing material, the chaos, for example? So maybe the act of creating is more organizing things than to do things out of nothing. But of course the example of God is not interesting because of gods. It's interesting because of people that thought about it and tried to figure out how to formulate, how to express our need to explain the existence of the world, our existence, and our motivation for action. So the first, the first works I did using VR and networks as well was uh, in 94, and uh, it, it was part of a series of works called The Big Questions. Of course, I was obliged to start with the big questions. I have to say, just had to understand why, instead of using painting or photography, what I did, or video, I should do something in real time that didn't come out of pre-existing material, and where I would have to decide of the rules and the laws that define how this works works. And maybe to decide what will be the nature of the interaction between people and the work itself. Is it a kind of dialogue? Is it just a spectacle? I'm in front of it and I just try to see if it's exciting or not. What is the nature of this interaction? It's got flat was a very simple work where I designed a kind of a monk room where people could be with a, a kind of bed and a chair and a table, and the table a screen and a mouse. Very simple. So it was 
small screen like that and nobody saw the big uh, silicon graphics computer behind. And so I decided that this world would be full. And instead of having an empty world where every detail would be visible immediately and I could decide, oh, I want that or that or that. No. I wanted people to be obliged to dig inside. To dig inside this full world in order to find things not expected. And I decided this world would be full of bricks. Because bricks was a, probably is probably the only thing that uh, uh, the humankind can do and animals cannot. So it's a world created, created by humans. And if we move inside, actually, the, the world is dug with corridors, and we are building an architecture that is just the path, the footprint of our experience of moving in the world, of existing in this world. And if we are lucky, we find floating images that represent how the humankind represent the gods supposed to have created the world in which they live. So it's something between the world creating, created by human and, and uh, the image of the creator or considered as such by human. Is God flat? That was the title. And you see it's a kind of labyrinth where the logic of the space that's not, now is very common in video games, but it was not so common in 94. The logic of the space is if you go forward, straight forward, then you come back to the, your original point. It's actually a torus. So you are completely stuck inside the, this world, and it's not only a labyrinth in, in which there is no, uh, you can dig wherever you want, because the walls are not limits, but you cannot find the exit, because there is no exit. Three months after this work, I decided that I would do the second of the big questions. So actually it was uh, Canal Plus who asked me to present his God Flat in uh, Imagina Festival in Monte Carlo. They wanted to put um, this work in Canal Plus booth. The problem is that you understand that this work has nothing to do in a TV channel booth. This wouldn't make sense. So the place where you present something is, of course, meaningful. So I told them, okay, I do a new work that will be the second of the big questions, and that will be totally dedicated or related to the context, a TV channel booth. So the second of the big questions is, is the devil curved? After it's got flat, of course. And then here we need, uh, I hope we have a bit of sound. No. Do you have sound? Okay. So you missed the, the best part. Uh, this thing, living in the sky, is actually just constituted uh, uh, with uh, five spheres. And uh, when you are in the space, it comes to you in this way that is a kind of floating, what, what we call at this time jelly motion. So that was the jelly motion coming to you. And with a sound that suggests that there is something sensual. There is a possible pleasure somewhere. And so when you touch it by coming very close to it, you give it pleasure. And if you stay more and more and more, the pleasure is higher. And you can probably reach the orgasm 
very soon. But if you don't like this shape, you can go away and it will vanish. And then, a little bit later, you will find another one, still made of five spheres, but organized in a different way, combined in a different way. And then again, pleasure or not, and then it vanished. It takes time for the visitor to understand that this thing is exactly behaving like a TV channel uh, prime time program. Trying to seduce a broader audience by modifying the shape all the time in order to find the shape that will seduce a maximum of people. So checking the shape, do you like it, you don't like, okay, I try another one. Do you like it, you don't like it, I try another one. Do you like it? And when you stay longer and longer, you get more rewards and the TV channel makes more money. So that is the devil curved. Of course the answer is the devil is probably not the one we think it is. This is another version, this is a PC version. PC for politically correct version. So the PC version, the color of the, um, the thing, what I call the Diabolo at this time, the color varies from acid pink to dark brown to be multiracial. And the sound is a combination made by Jean-Baptiste Barrière of different sounds coming from a uh, lion, a uh, cat, and what was the third one? Maybe the wolf or something like that. Of course, as you come closer to the climax, the sound becomes again a female voice. Because of course I got some reaction from the previous work. Some people who say, oh yeah, it's very sexist. First you find only female voice. And so, so I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like that, you know. It's my work. So I do, I do as I feel it. And actually at this time in Imagina, it was a little bit different from now. It was 98% of males coming. So it would be completely absurd if I wanted to get the maximum of audience to do something that would be, uh, that would concern more females. So the, it, it has nothing to do with uh, equity. At the same time, I was asked to do, to create a work where maybe we could dig, and why not between Paris and Montreal, Canada. It was in 95, the tunnel under the Atlantic, between the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal and the Pompidou Center in Paris. So you see, uh, at the top, you see Montreal, and here, the Pompidou Center. The, the concept was pretty simple, but actually the work was not simple at all. But the concept was to say, okay, we are both sides, let's dig a tunnel to meet first. The second thing is, but what to dig in? Should we create, uh, recreate the, the background of the Atlantic? I was not interested in simulation, so it was not about geology. So I thought, okay, the obstacle is not matter. It's not the stones uh, of the Atlantic. The obstacle is a culture, the big difference of culture. So I decided that there would be digging inside pictures that would be related to the common culture of France and Canada. And the pictures were converted into blocks, extruded like uh, blocks of marble, in which, by digging, 
we could have we could see the detail on the side so you see different kind of uh, this is Renoir uh, Champlain drawings Cézanne and then if you dig out you create big caves like that and you see it's like uh, to be uh, surrounded by fragments of memory at the same time you are actually talking with the other and the direction of the voice was a good way to meet so people try to meet each other uh, by going in the right direction but sometimes just uh, playing with the fact that they could uh, uh, create the space and the architecture of the space like that and the video of each people was floating in the space in the street space and this was the first meeting after five days of digging I can see you, you're dressed in red with a white color. Imagine people coming one or two hours a day, coming day after day, and this is exactly what happened. They were sitting around, waiting for the time of the meeting. And after five days, finally, they meet. And this day, they probably waited something like uh, three hours, uh, digging, one leaving the place to another, it was a joystick. And the thing they have to say is you're dressed in red with a white color. And this is of course a very important point. The fact that to be in touch through technologies is not necessarily about transmitting information. It's not about bringing some news or some very important uh, event and, uh, and uh, facts to the other. It's more about being in touch. So this is what we call in communication theory the fatigue function. The fact to establish the contact and to maintain the contact. And all the media we are using now are probably dedicated for more than a half to the fatigue function. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. And you, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Oh, how are you? Are you, you? Well, and you? Well, excellent. See you tomorrow. Everything is said. You exist, I exist. And we can check tomorrow if we still exist. Another important point was about dialogue. As you see, it's an interactive work where the, everything is a result of the experience of dialoguing. I talk with people, that gives me the direction, but at the same time, the content I'm digging, I'm talking about it sometime. We talk about what we see. And this content, uh, is also organized by what I call at this time the gars de vue. I mean the guy from uh, the pictures, the guy of the pictures, uh, but it's coming from a, a Canadian expression. And uh, this program, this software, actually organize the pictures according to the interests we express for the picture we have seen before. It's creating a dynamic profile of the user's experience and organizing the content not according to a localization space but according to the, according to the motivation of the visitor. So the content is organized exactly the same way than the architecture. There is no pre-existing architecture, there is no pre-organized content. There is no pre-existing shape there is no pre-existing uh, sequence of images. Everything is the result of the experience of moving inside and is a result of meeting the other. 
then more and more came to my mind the idea that I was working on situations. I was creating situations. It's more than image. I was not creating image. I was creating a situation in which, thanks to image and sounds, uh, and databases, and uh, automatic organization of things, and uh, adaptive and reactive things, and a specialized sound, and, uh, and so on, I, cre I create a specific context in which we are drawn to react. In 97, so two years after, I did a, a work in a cave, an Ars Electronica cave in, in Linz, called World Skin, a photo safari in the land of war. This work uh, is really a matter of situation. We are invited to get inside a cave, you know, this cubic uh, space where we are surrounded by the image, like the SAS cube. And we have photo cameras because we are tourists of the virtual. As you can see, the world is made of pictures from the Second World War and the Bosnia War. When you, we take a picture, what we take is we move from the scene, becomes white, and is printed out. It becomes real. I create a memory of my experience, but at the same time, I erase the memory. And there are remaining ghosts in the space that are probably the witnesses of my action. And what happened? Here you see uh, in the cave, only when there is one person, but the interesting is when there is a group of people. Because when there is a group of people, people behave in a different way. And this situation leads us to make the experience of being in the context where you can be compelled to do something, maybe you can be asked to do something, and then you can think about why you're doing this. And the sound work by Jean-Baptiste Barrière was helping us to suddenly having a very quiet sound not being able to shoot anymore, and then think about what we were doing. What is this meaning? What does it mean if, uh, if uh, somebody like uh, us is suddenly in the middle of war, and suddenly the laws are not the same? We are allowed to kill. We can do it. We are even obliged to do it. We are asked to do it. And suddenly, the world is completely reversed. So for me, it was very interesting to use this kind of uh, immersive environment in order to experience the fact to be put in a situation where we could be doing things and then thinking about why that way. That this was in uh, probably Stockholm or Denmark, this work has been moving uh, all around the world. So this is the kind of prints uh, we used to get. In 99, I have to check the time, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, it's already 47. <laughs> in 99, uh, I did this work that was also about communication and dialogue called Crossing Talks. It was uh, in the ICC in Tokyo, and this work is also a cave work uh, connected to the internet. So the world is like that, made of uh, cubes, 
virtual cubes exactly like the cave, but it's an infinite number of cubes. With people in the internet talking in their language, and maybe that, yeah, that's uh, better like that for me. Maybe not for the camera. <laughs> So, when you're in the cave, you are surrounded by these people, and uh, when you're in the box where you had an internet connection, you can communicate with people in the cave. So far, so good. So, what becomes interesting is the way to navigate in this space. When you're in the cave, the world is supposed to be flat, even if there, there is no ground. And when you're in the middle, everything is okay, you can talk with some people around you. But if you move on the side, then the world, the world tilts, and you slip from one room to another. And if you stay a long time like that, you can go very fast. And then you cannot talk to people very far away. If other people come in the room, you have to talk with them if you want to stabilize and to talk to somebody far away. This is what I call the elevator syndrome. The fact that when there is a crisis, people uh, start to talk with each other. Otherwise, it's easier to talk with somebody at the other end of the world instead of talking with somebody in the elevator. In the year 2000, uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, what we could share that is not possible to share uh, without uh, specific technologies. And so the, the way to watch things can be something interesting to share. So that was in the Pompidou Center in the year 2000. And I invited the, the audience of the Pompidou Center, the visitors, to discover the exhibition about beauty, uh, art exhibition in Avignon, the south of France. And you see a big screen that was 11 meters wide and people could discover the other exhibition with binoculars, VR binoculars. And they were only watching spherical photographies. What they didn't notice immediately is the fact when they, that when they look at the, the artworks, they are actually painting what I call the collective retinal memory. So this is uh, the, the pictures they were looking at. So whatever you look at becomes part of, the, uh, of uh, what is projected on the big screen. So you create spaces like that, that evolves dynamically and works exactly like a palimpsest. Uh, that means uh, every thing painted can be recovered uh, can be hidden by a new part later. And it was not only pictures from the exhibition, but also very banal places, like uh, the quarry where you find the stones, or the supermarket, or the slaughterhouse. And the result, of course, is a kind of competition in terms of retinal seduction between artworks and very ordinary places like a supermarket. And you see a supermarket can take a lot of place in, in the visuals, in the resulting memory. Okay. So, this was, uh, yeah, samples. I have to uh, speed up a bit. That was another work using the same uh, collective retinal memory to create stories. 
and it was in a ZKM for the exhibition Future, Future Cinema and we are lucky because we are the curator of the exhibition here. <laughs> Jeffrey uh, was uh, at this time uh, directing the, uh, the center and, and uh, organizing this exhibition. That was actually a great exhibition. Okay, I thought it was a uh, blot. So this one is about telling a story by watching but uh, it will be too long, so I would like to show some few other works. Now there are only uh, 451 slides, so that explains why it's so slow. <laughs> okay, I, I tried to, to stop that because it will be too long. And I will just show you, I will show you uh, just a few recent works because those works are already old, 10 years old. This work. Maybe i show you another work uh, using the same technology. That was in the year 2005, Cosmopolis. And uh, as it was uh, dedicated uh, to the French here in China, uh, we expected a lot of people to come, so I needed to build a very uh, study study um, uh, binoculars, telescopes. So each telescope could uh, provide uh, seven, uh, six, up to six or seven uh, panoramas from each city. And here we had 12 telescopes for 12 different cities. They are optimistic. <laughs> No, I, I, I go faster. Okay, so that was, uh, you see, it's a big panorama with 12, uh, 4 by 3 meters uh, screens and 12 telescopes and 12 uh, plasma screens to see what people are looking at. And uh, so the 12 people looking at cities were actually painting one city that combined, of course, uh, all the details uh, people were looking at. And this is some of the panoramas that has been created for that. This is Shanghai. And the principle of uh, the retinal memory is that one. So th that was done before, so this is not exactly a kind of, um, of treatment we get. And then it alternates with in a more analytic uh, times when uh, by scanning the panoramas in the center, we have information. This is the thing done before going to China. And we had uh, uh, up to uh, 10,000, more than 10,000 people a day coming to the exhibition. So that was uh, great in Shanghai here. So you see the, the graphic effect. And uh, the great thing, so yeah, that was the the opening of the uh, Three Gorge Museum in Chongqing and the exhibition opening. And this is uh, uh, the result, uh, one, one uh, instant of uh, the retinal memory. So, I just promised to talk about fusion. Immersion is to be as a real person inside the fiction, surrounded by the fiction. Fusion is the mix of fiction and reality. This is what happens, for example, with uh, reality shows. This is what happens every time when you have uh, artificial effects on a real thing. And fusion leads to a certain kind of uh, entertainment. And this is why uh, the situationist used to say that uh, this was fusion is building the society of the spectacle. That means illusions and a way to hide reality to people. I talk more about critical fusion. The idea to use the introduction of fiction inside reality in order to make it more understandable. So it's a critical way of using fusion inside the real world. 
So watch out was in 2002 in Seoul. <laughs> when we put boxes in the street and people look inside the box and they see send a warning message to the world. So but with an SMS you can send a message to the world. Something like save the whales, don't consume too much and so on. What they don't see immediately is that when they look inside the box, their eye is actually watching the world. So here it, it is the eye of the people watching the box. And this is a, in the exhibition space, we could go inside and see that. That was in Athens later. During the Olympic Games in 2004, near reason, and maybe I will stop with this one because it will be too much. So that was in 2008 in uh, in Shanghai. As you can see, this uh, what they call the ID worms, swallow ideas, uh, the identity of people. And so take the face and convert it into flash code. So yeah, you can do it well. So you see the conversion process. And then the flash codes became become uh, like tiles in the city on the big screen on the left. See the ID city and the tiles start growing and build actually the city. City built with people and by people. And this is what you see here. Creating a big uh, one dimension code, the barcode. So I think I will, I will stop here, just maybe to have one or two questions, uh, because I have 30 or 40 more works, so it's <laughs> it will be too short. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.